Um, so, hi, I'm Oliver, um, and my project specifically looks at the microstructural damage and the defamation mechanisms that ballistic impacts cause. And as Lisa mentioned, that's kind of small arms and shrapnel damage. Um, and yeah, it's part of this Heritage in the Crossfire project. Um, so I have two main sort of data sets that I can utilize in my projects. I've got our experimental samples, which we generated at the firing range last week. Um, and for those, I can use both non-destructive and destructive methods. Um, and there's field examples, which are our kind of safe analogies, um, such as shrapnel damage around uh, London from the war. And we did some work at a church in Portsmouth in the UK, which also had bomb damage from the war. Um, and for those, we're limited to surface measurements and observations like that, because you can't go cutting sections out of a piece of heritage to a look at it under a microscope. Um, so our, for the last year of my PhD, um, I've been sort of trialing some methods on this test block, which was shot as part of the pilot study to the Heritage in the Crossfire. Um, it's just a block of, it's a block of sandstone from northern Spain. Um, it's 15 centimeters cubed. Um, it was shot with the same ammunition as our samples last week were shot with, a 7.62 Yugoslavian round. Um, at a distance of about 200 meters. Um, and as you can see by the arrow, that's our impact direction. And this was originally orientated so that all of this was the top left corner of the block. Um, and we'll be seeing lots more images of this block uh, throughout my presentation. Um, so I, from the title of my, my talk, I'm gonna start with a macro scale, sort of surface observations. And I'm gonna be working my way down through the scales of observation, um, right down to the grains that make up the stone that we're looking at. Um, and so the first method is photogrammetry. And simply put, that's the generation of a 3D model from a series of 2D images. Um, it's an incredibly useful and powerful technique. Um, and it's relatively low cost and, and easy and accessible to everyone. Um, and so what we did is we simply we put our block in a little homemade light box with some LED lamps, a couple of cameras on some tripods. Um, and we rotate the block. Um, taking a picture sort of every 10 to 15 degrees of rotation um, from these three orientations, flip the block over, do it again. Um, and what we do is we then put this into a, a photogrammetry software, um, which reconstructs those camera positions, generates a depth map, and you get these nice textured 3D meshes, which we can export into other programs and take quantitative measurements uh, and analysis from. Uh, and so here's just an example of that. I used a program called Cloud Compare. It's open source, it's freely accessible to everyone. Um, and it, although it looks nice and colorful, it is a serious piece of scientific data collection. Um, I used a, a facet detection algorithm, which simplifies the geometry of our mesh, breaks it down into smaller planes, um, which are called facets, which are these little squares you can see here. And it gives me an orientation of that in 3D space. And now that's interesting to me as a geologist, because this damage is an expression of the fracture networks within our sample on the surface. And so if we can characterize them on the surface, we can start to make inferences of what they do inside our block. So when we go to a column that's been hit with a round, we can do one of these models, get these facets out, see these different fracture networks, and then say, well, maybe we've got these orientations of fractures. Um, and that can be important for the, the weathering aspects because if our, if our fracture is, so this is our surface, if our fracture is parallel to the surface, that's not really going to encourage uh, moisture and fluids into our stone. But if it's perpendicular to our surface, that's a conduit for fluids and moisture to get much, much deeper and cause you know, much more pervasive weathering. Um, and so to summarize this and this nice colorful uh, stereo net on the side, um, we have a steep northwest dipping set, which is represented by this group of, of points, uh, and a shallower kind of sub-horizontal group, which is represented by this lot, which you can kind of see, and this is this step-like morphology that's on the corner of our block. Um, and so now we've looked at what the fractures do on the surface. Um, as Lisa mentioned, we can use CT scanning, uh, or X-ray computer tomography, to look at what those fractures are doing inside our blocks. Um, and the way this works is you pass x-rays through your sample, um, and the energy of that x-ray is absorbed differentially based on the elements and minerals you have. And so air 
doesn't really absorb x-rays, and so it'll appear dark in the, the images that I'm going to follow. This. Um, and so we looked at it at two scales. We did our full block to look at the, the macro fractures. So these are kind of the open aperture fractures that we can see on the surface and that Lisa had plenty of nice images of. And then I did a series of smaller subsamples, which are tiny little cuboids at a much higher resolution to try and look at the micro fracture behavior and see how they interact with grains and the matrix. And so here's uh, an example slice, um, which is just, uh, so each pixel is 110 microns by 110 microns. And each slice, I have a slice for every 110 microns throughout the sample. And so what you do is you, through a laborious process of each slice, highlighting your fractures, you can build up the 3D geometries, which Lisa's uh, diagram in the previous presentation showed quite nicely. Um, as this is a much, quite a large block, um, it takes quite a lot of time. I haven't managed to finish doing that. So you've just got one slice. Um, but you can see these two different fracture orientations uh, and how they relate to different parts of, of our, our damaged face. And so this is the macro fractures. Uh, and again, yeah, like I say, we have these perpendicular sets. And then looking at the micro fractures, so we're on a much smaller scale now. Uh, the whole sample is 7 by 7 mil, and it was a 20 mil cuboid. And we've got these kind of wiggly, to use the scientific term, fractures. Um, but, but they're interesting because they, they, they exhibit both transgranular and intergranular behavior, which basically means we have fractures that go around the grains, breaking the, the grain matrix boundaries, and we have fractures that go kind of through the grains themselves. And this is really, and this is a sample, sorry, proximal to our impact. Um, and so it's important to understand these behaviors on all scales so that you can apply it to kind of the bigger picture of this, this, this damage that's done. Um, and so the next step is to look, uh, is to cut a sample up some more uh, into small stubs which you use under the scanning electron microscope and for optical thin sections. And so this is a sample from the impact crater there. And like Lisa showed in the previous slide, we've got these transgranular fractures breaking quartz grains. We've got the clay matrix is kind of disaggregated. And we've got damage to the platelets. And you've got this kind of fine powdery dust, which is just the breaking down of smaller minerals um, and some of the weaker constituent minerals of the sandstone um, in our sample. And so if we look at this in thin section, the samples from taken up here, so the top of this image is the crater floor of, of the impact. And we've got these parallel sets of transgranular fractures through all of our constituent grains. And this is really important from a, like a, a structural geologist's point of view, because it gives us information on stress fields and things like that, which I won't bore you with. But these provide sort of micro conduits for, for moisture and um, weather and things. And this is just the same picture in cross-polarized light, just to highlight some of these fractures a little bit better. Um, and so if we move slightly further away now to, to the edge of that initial crater rim, we see a preference now for fracturing along the boundary between our constituent grains and our matrix, which results in this plucking behavior. Um, and we see less of these transgranular fractures. And if we move further away still to sort of this fracture surface over here, no, nope, not yet. <laughs> yeah, and so in thin section, we see that same thing. These fractures are going around grains as opposed to through them. There are some examples where um, they will cross a grain if it's um, not orientated or it's, it's so large that the fracture just has to go through it. Um, but generally, we see this, these open aperture fractures going around grains. Now we move away um, to this fracture surface here. And the grains and the matrix themselves are quite intact. And damage is essentially localized to this fracture plane, and there's no deformation or damage away from that fracture surface. Um, so we've looked at the fractures, uh, the damage and deformation on the grain scale and the kind of interaction of this. Now we're going to go even smaller and look at the deformation inside grains. Um, and so we got access, thanks to the Science and Technology Facilities Council, to a neutron diffraction instrument in Harwell, Oxford. And to simplify it a lot, we sh shot neutrons through our sample, um, and it gave us information on the crystallographic structure of the grains that make up that sample. 
So if you imagine a perfect, beautiful quartz crystal, uh, like you'd see in a gem shop or at the Natural History Museum, um, we have what we call crystallographic planes. So we've got the basal plane, prism plane, and the Ron planes at the point. And what happens is when a neutron interacts with one of these planes, it diffracts at a certain amount based on that crystallographic plane, which is kind of unique to most uh, the planes within a mineral. And our detector banks detect that change. And by applying stress to our sample and measuring the change in the distance in this, these crystal planes with the stress that we apply to our sample, we can build up an idea of how the mineral constituents of our stone respond to further applied stress. And the reason we experimented with this is because we have a block in a wall, in a building. It's shot. It has a load applied to it in the subsequent stories above that block. And so if we, if, depending on how the, the material characteristics are, are changed, you know, we may have increased compliance or it might make it stronger. Um, and so that will affect that mineral's ability to um, deal with load. And then, you know, if that ability is lost, that's when all of these impacts start to add up to a serious issue for your, for your thing. Um, and so this is the setup. We have our detectors on the side here and here. The beam comes through these little slits. Our sample's in the stress streak just there. Um, looks very high tech and scientific. Um, you get a bunch of numbers, and we plot a graph that looks like this. Um, and so what this is, this is just the, the stress we apply. So you could think of it as stories of a building or um, mass on top, and the natural strain, which is the amount that those crystals are deforming with this applied stress. And what these colorful lines represent is uh, samples taken medial, proximal, and distal to the impact. And what I do is I do some maths and some boring statistics, and I get the Young's modulus, which is a measure of a material's elastic response. And so for a single crystal of quartz, its Young's modulus should be about 70 gigapascals. So it's, and so our proximal sample is lower than that, and then it lowers as we move further away. Now, the consensus in, in the literature and uh, engineering science is that the more damaged something is, the more elastically compliant it is, and so the lower this value. So that makes sense. But what doesn't make sense if, is that we've seen the most damage proximal to the impact, and yet it still has a stiffer response than those samples medial and distal to our impact. Um, and so we don't really know what's going on. And we'd need to do more, more tests, more experiments on some different samples to try and get to grips with actually what's going on with this. But it was a very interesting method to try. Um, and it shows that these impacts aren't just affecting the, the stone with fractures um, and grain comminution. We're actually affecting the material characteristics of the grains that make up those blocks. Um, so now I just want to talk a little bit about some of the programs and software I've used, because I'm very much for the open source, open access kind of approach and increase the accessibility. So for the photogrammetry, all you really need is a camera and a computer. Um, there are actually mobile apps now, so it is making its way into smartphones. Um, and so the big pay program for processing that is Agisoft. But I use a program called Meshroom, which is as good. Um, it's a little less user friendly, but you essentially drag and drop your pictures. You get out a model, which I then put into a program called MeshLab, which I use to scale and clean up the models a little bit so they're nice and tidy. And then I mentioned Cloud Compare to do some analytics. For the X-ray CT, the big paid one is Aviso, but the licenses are several thousand dollars. Um, so there's a program called Dragonfly, which for non-commercial use for researchers, students, you can get the full access to it for free. So I'm using that combined with ImageJ, which is a really powerful sort of um, Java-based image processing tool that is, is free to access. And I use that to uh, uh, analyze my thin sections and fracture networks and things as well. And then for the neutron diffraction, we use uh, Open Genie, which is developed by the labs. But it's, again, it's open access. And there's another program called Maud. Um, if anyone is actually interested in it. Um, and so to the fun bit, sample generation, 
last week we were at Kotec, which is a firing range within the UK. It's pretty much the only place we can go to to shoot stuff in a scientific way. Um, and so this is the setup. We've got a Doppler radar here for uh, projectile velocity. We've got a nice proof barrel with an electromagnetic firing mechanism on the back. Uh, camera hide to keep the high-speed camera and thermal imaging camera safe. And then our little block wedged between some concrete penline blocks down the end. Um, so this distance is about 15 meters, but we artificially lower the propellant loads to simulate this block being impacted at 200 meters downrange. Because if you try and hit a block repeatedly dead center at 200 meters, even with a proof barrel, you're not going to have a very good time. Um, and so this is our kind of like command center. You've got your firing box, and we've got laptops for each of the instruments, uh, a little CCTV setup thing. And then I'm just going to show a very what I think is powerful uh, video just showing how much damage these impacts can do to limestone blocks. And so what I will use, I'll use some of the slow motion videos like this to kind of look at the fracture mechanics and other stuff that for me is interesting, but for everyone out here is probably not as interesting as the, the rest of the slow motion. Um, and so just to summarize, uh, for the last year I've been looking at a multitude of methods to try and study the fractures and damage at a multitude of scales. Um, and we've seen this change in damage style and intensity with proximity to impact. Um, and these methods are going to kind of prove as the foundation to apply to a larger data set that we collected last week. Uh, and the experimental samples. And the main goal for me uh, and my project is to link that surface damage to the internal deformation that I'm studying through these methods so that when we go to the field and we see damage, we can make an educated assessment of what that internal damage is going to look like. So thank you everyone for listening. And then, um, yeah, just thanks to Manchester X-ray Imaging Facility for letting us use the CT scanners, Science and Technology Facility Councils for the NGINX, there's a DOI to our experiment there. Um, again, Cranfield Ordnance Test Evaluation Center and the Levy Hume Trust and my department for being enthusiastic as ever. Um, and there's my social media and email if anyone has any questions that aren't asked today. Uh, thank you. <laughs>